Hello, AP Biology students, and welcome to Unit 6. Uh, this is Lecture Topic 1, looking at DNA and RNA structure, and the kind of getting a little bit of a history as uh, the race began to discover uh, the molecule of DNA and, and what it looked like physically. Um, so ultimately, uh, the discovery of DNA structure once we started to realize in biology that DNA was the molecule that was uh, important for transmitting that information from one generation to the next, people wanted to, to study more about it. And there was this race to determine uh, what this DNA molecule looked like. So uh, this race became uh, very big back in the 1950s. So that truly in a sense isn't that long ago and one of the the, the uh, pe one of the people that was involved in this was a lady by the name of Rosalind Franklin and in the 1950s Rosalind Franklin performed an x-ray crystallography of DNA um, some structures uh, when they <clears throat> when they solidify form these crystals and in chemistry, when you form crystals and you pass some sort of light source or laser beam through it, you get this uh, uh, refraction of material. And ultimately, what this did is her X-ray crystallography of DNA, um, due to the refraction, it showed that her work revealed this pattern that was regular and repetitive, ultimately illustrating that DNA was indeed a double helix. And you could see um, basically how she did that, past the laser beam through, you got the refraction of material. This is what her photograph looked like. And if you compare it to what the DNA molecule looked like, you could see how you have the spiraling of the double helix there. Uh, the next thing, uh, another gentleman that played a role in, in helping to determine what DNA structure was was Erwin Chargaff. And during this time, Erwin Car Chargaff analyzed DNA samples from different species. And he found the following rule held true for, for all organisms that he studied. And that is that the amount of adenine is going to equal the amount of thymine. And the amount of cytosine is equal to the amount of guanine. And these are the rules for base pairing. So, uh, Adenine and thymine will always bind, bind together, and cytosine will always pair up with, with guanine there. And you can see that they pair up right in here, and how they're held together uh, via these hydrogen bonds. So between adenine and thymine, we get two hydrogen bonds. And between guanine and cytosine, you see three hydrogen bonds forming there. So the A's pairs with T's, and the G's pairs with C. These are the rules for base pairing, as suggested by Erwin Chargaff. So if we take a look, a further look at the nucleotide structures, we have those nucleotides that are considered purines, which are adenine and guanine, and you have those that are pyrimidines, which are cytosine and thymine in the DNA molecule, but you have uracil, which is found in RNA. So purines, basically, uh, they are double ring structures, and pyrimidines are single ring structures, and ultimately, uh, if you look at them, here you can see that their structures here. So here you have these double rings here, and down here you have these single rings forming these nitrogenous bases. So when we look at nucleotide pairing, the, the pairs, as stated previously, are held together via hydrogen bonds. So if we go back to basic chemistry, that's important because of our bond formations, hydrogen bonds are the weakest but that of uh, triple covalent bonds being the strongest. So here we have these weak hydrogen bonds that are, that are electrostatically holding uh, these, two, these two rings or, or ladders together that would make up the DNA molecule. So again, you see between guanine and cytosine, there are three hydrogen bonds, and between adenine and thymine, there are two hydrogen bonds. So for a quick review, think ahead to DNA replication. You've learned this before, but we're going to go a little bit more in depth. How might the hydrogen bonds aid in this process? 
Well, the fact that hydrogen bonds allow for DNA strands to be easily separated during the replication process, so it's going to allow those weak bonds are going to be able to be pulled apart and expose those nucleotides in order for the DNA molecule parental strands to be copied to form two new strands. A DNA sample is analyzed and you find that 22% is cytosine. How much thymine would you expect the sample to have? So you need to follow Erwin Chargaff's rules for base pairing here. So if there's 22% cytosine, that means there would be 22% guanine. So then you would take that 22 and 22, add it up, you get 44%. Subtract 44% from 100. And then ultimately what you would end up with is 56%. So 56% of the DNA molecule must be that of um, adding in thymine. So you take that 56%, divide it by 2, which will give you 28% thymine and 28% adenine. So now we're in this race, and knowing these things, we, we really want to discover the structure of DNA. And whoever will come out on top with the discovery of the structure of DNA um, would be what this would be a huge advancement in the field of biology. And this is where Watson and Crick come into play. So Watson and Crick combined the findings of Franklin's helix shape and Chargaff's base pairing to create the first 3D double helix model of DNA. They pretty much took these like cutouts of DNA nucleotides and they kept piecing them together. And every time they would do this, they, they would their, their model that they would build would kind of meet the criteria for some things about DNA but ultimately, it wouldn't make sense for all things about DNA that we knew at the time. Um, so uh, it just so happens, and it, it's unfortunate, but um, Watson uh, went over to the lab of uh, Rosalind Franklin, and he pretty much stole her evidence. Um, he walked in that lab, and he saw this X-ray crystallography sitting there, and he pretty much took it. And, um, and ran with those results with, without her knowing. And it, it was because of, of Rosalind Franklin's X-ray crystallography and that helix shape and then following those rules of base pairing that they, they were start, starting to visualize what this DNA molecule looked like. And it, it actually happened that Watson was uh, at one of the local pubs in England and he was sitting there uh, drinking a beer this is what I read in a book anyway. And he was sitting there drinking a beer and it came to him. He, he thought of it and he called up Crick and he said, let's go to the lab. So James Watson and Francis Crick reported to the lab and they started to take their nucleotide cutouts and piece, piece them together. And ultimately, um, from that, they, they uh, built the structure of DNA. And by, by building that structure of DNA, this model of DNA, um, it fit all the different components that really need to make sense in order for DNA to be able to do what it does. So the key features of DNA structure is basically that DNA is a double-stranded helix. The backbone is alternating sugar phosphate molecules. The center are these nucleotides that follow the rules for base pairing, A's with T's and C's with G's. The DNA strands are anti-parallel to one another which means one strand runs from a five prime to three prime end, while the other strand runs opposite. So it's kind of upside down running three prime to five prime. Don't think in mathematical terms. If you would look at this, you would say, yes, these two strands are parallel. But when we say about one being parallel and the other being anti-parallel, it's gonna be this three prime to five prime in one direction. And then in the other strand, you see it going five prime to three prime. So they mathematically they do run parallel but biologically they're anti-parallel because one strand is right side up and the other strand is upside down so to speak so that that five prime end has that free phosphate group so no matter where that five prime end is you have a free phosphate group and a three prime end has that that free hydroxyl group and when you talk about three prime to five prime you're looking at which carbon that those phosphate groups and hydroxyl groups are attached to. 
So if we look, what is the key function of DNA? DNA is the primary source of heritable information. The genetic information is stored in and passed from one generation to the next through the DNA molecule. The exception is RNA. RNA is the primary source of heritable information in some viruses. So if we take a further look at DNA and really compare the, the DNA of a eukaryotic cell, and if we go back to a eukaryotic cell, remember that these are cells that have a true nucleus and membrane-bound organelles. So this would be in the kingdoms plantae, fungi, protista, and animalia. And then we compare it to that of the DNA of prokaryotic cells, which are bacteria, and prokaryotes do not have true membrane-bound organelles, and they do not have a true nucleus, Basically, that their DNA is stored in a region called the nucleoid. So when we look at the DNA of these two uh, cell types, um, the DNA is found in the nucleus of a eukaryotic cell, and we have these linear chromosomes. But in prokaryotic cells, the DNA is in a nucleoid region, and the DNA is going to be circular. So you get these circular chromosomes in the nucleoid region, for which... Uh, to which the bacterial genetic information is stored. So our two prokaryotic kingdoms are the RK bacteria and the true bacteria, the U bacteria there. So prokaryotes and some eukaryotes also contain small circular pieces of DNA called plasmids. And these small circular DNA molecules that are separate from the chromosomes themselves are found in the cells. So let's take a further look at a plasmid. Plasmids replicate independently from chromosome, chromosomal DNA, um, primarily found in prokaryotic organisms, which are bacteria, and they contain the genes that may be useful to the prokaryote when it is in a particular environment, but may not be required for survival. So here you can see in this diagram the chromosomal DNA versus the plasmids, which are these circular DNA molecules. So plasmids can be manipulated in laboratories. Um, plasmids can be removed from bacteria. Then a gene of interest can be inserted into a plasmid to form recombinant plasmid DNA. When the recombinant plasmid is inserted back into the bacteria, that gene that was inserted into the plasmid will now be expressed phenotypically. Bacteria can exchange genes found on plasmids with neighboring bacteria. Um, once DNA is exchanged, the bacteria then can express the gene that was acquired. And ultimately, this helps with the survival of prokaryotes. And when we think of bacteria, and we think of some of the things that we see today, especially with antibiotic resistance and how quickly bacteria evolve, this is a part of that. So let's look at the sister molecule of DNA, which is RNA. And RNA, ribonucleic acid, versus DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, is a single helix instead of a double helix. And instead of having the nitrogenous space thymine, we now have this nitrogenous space called, a, called uracil. So when comparing the two, RNA is called ribonucleic acid. It's a single-stranded alpha helix molecule. And we have, as far as base pair, base, bases, nitrogenous bases, we have adenine and uracil and cytosine and guanine. DNA, however, is deoxyribonucleic acid. It's a double-stranded helix molecule. And we know that adenine bonds with thymine and cytosine is going to bond with guanine there. So let's do a quick review. What was Chargaff's rule? Answer. In any species, the amount of adenine is equal to thymine and the amount of cytosine is equal to that of guanine in DNA. What comprises the backbone of DNA? It's a sugar phosphate group that alternates down the backbone. If we go back to singing, we're going to have to sing it in class, that DNA song. Which nucleotides are purines? It would be adenine and guanine. Think ag agriculture, you want pure agriculture, so adenine and guanine are the purines. What types of bonds hold together nucleotides? That would be hydrogen bonds, which are the weakest of the bond types, which is important 
for when we get into DNA replication and even get into like protein synthesis. So, summarize the scientific contributions of Chargaff, Franklin, and Watson and Crick. Chargaff came up with the rules of base pairing. Rosalind Franklin, her X-ray crystallography picture showed that DNA was a double helix, and Watson and Crick created the first full 3D model of DNA. Um, the structure of DNA it was discovered, I want to say, in 19... It was the late 1950s, 57, 59, and I think it was in the month of April. Um, it was when Watson and Crick came forward with their discovery, and their findings were later published in the Journal of Nature. What are some key differences between RNA and DNA? DNA is a double-stranded, and adenine, uh, DNA is double-stranded, and adenine bonds to thymine, where RNA is single-stranded, and adenine is going to bond to uracil there. So, practice FRQ. Free response question. Here we go. Many species of bacteria are becoming resistant to antibiotics. Recently, studies have analyzed the chromosomal DNA of antibiotic-resistant bacteria. One bacteria studied is methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, which is also known as MRSA. Researchers have found that its chromosomal DNA does not contain the genes for antibiotic resistance. They also found when MRSA is cultured with a non-resistant bacteria, the non-resistant bacteria becomes antibiotic-resistant. A, identify the location of the antibiotic-resistant gene, and B, discuss how the antibiotic-resistant genes are being transmitted to non-resistant bacteria when cultured together. So think about that, and we'll discuss this in class. So that's it for lecture topic one of unit six. Be sure to go on and work on your topic one questions. And I thank you again for tuning in. And from here, we'll move on to our next topic then, I think, which is DNA replication. So have a nice day, everybody.